Well, I wonder, have you ever wondered if the Bible is really able to help you with your deepest problems? Or perhaps, have you ever been skeptical about whether or not the Bible really actually lays out for us what the local church should look like, what our evangelism should look like, and how success and failure should be defined? Or perhaps, have you ever struggled to know what to do with your life and wished that you had some special word from the Lord to guide you? Or have you ever secretly thought to yourself that the Bible's teachings on gender or sexuality or any other number of matters needs updating for the 21st century? Or have you ever wished, perhaps, that you had a more direct, more personal revelation from God than you get through your regular reading of the Bible? Well, if you can answer yes to any of those questions, and I would venture to guess that all of us have or will at some time and in some degree answered yes to at least one of those questions, then you have struggled with the issue of the sufficiency of Scripture. And it's that topic that we're going to come to this morning as we come to this final week that we've broken from our regular study of the book of Romans. And we've been in this study now for this fourth week studying the Reformation doctrine of sola scriptura, that our salvation is according to Scripture alone. This morning, you're really going to get a two-for-one special sermon because we were planning on going five weeks. I was out last week, so you're getting two sermons in one this morning as we are going to cover not only the sufficiency of God's Word, but also as we enter into the new year tonight, going into tomorrow, as we consider at the end of our time this morning our own personal commitment to God's Word. Let me just briefly remind you what we've covered so far, in case you haven't been here, in case you just need a fresh reminder. We've answered the question in this study of Sola Scriptura of what God's Word is. We've said it is the authoritative Word of the Lord. It carries the very same binding authority and nature as God himself, as it is God's words to us. We've answered the question of how we got this word as we cover the inspiration of Scripture. And then Dylan answered the question for us of the truthfulness of God's word as he preached on the inerrancy of Scripture. And now this morning, we get to answer the question concerning the scope of this word. What exactly does God's word address? How complete is it? Should we be looking as God's people for further revelation from God? Can we really rely on this word to help us in all the matters of our life and godliness? Well, to help us tackle this topic, we're going to turn to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read the first four verses of, of this book. Follow along with me as I read in Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in, the, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So our first topic, and the bulk of our time we're going to spend discussing this morning, is the fact that God's word is sufficient. Well, before we jump in and consider Hebrews 1, we really need to ask the question and answer the question, well, what does this mean that God's word is sufficient? What does the sufficiency of Scripture mean? Let me begin by giving you a definition from Matthew Barrett. He writes, The sufficiency of Scripture means that all things necessary for salvation and for living the Christian life in obedience to God and for his glory are given to us in the scriptures. This is really just a lengthier definition of the same thing that Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1 chapter 3 or verse 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain 
to life and godliness. No one can say that God has not revealed enough in his word for us to know how to be saved and for us to know how to live a life pleasing to him. We do not need any additions to his word to meet the challenges of today. We do not need any subtractions from his word to mesh better with the cultural climate of the day. Rather, his word is perfect. His word is complete. His word gives us everything we need to know about Christ, everything we need to know about salvation, and everything we need to know about living a life pleasing to him. Unfortunately, it is often this doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture that is the one that evangelicals forget the most quickly. Let me read you a lengthier quote from Kevin DeYoung, but he puts it so well when he writes this. If authority is the liberal problem, clarity the postmodern problem, and necessity the problem for atheists and agnostics, then sufficiency is the attribute most quickly doubted by rank-and-file church-going Christians. We can say all the right things about the Bible, even read it regularly, but when life gets difficult or just a bit boring, we look for new words, we look for new revelation, we look for new experiences to bring us closer to God. We feel rather ho-hum about the New Testament's description of heaven, but we're mesmerized by the accounts of school-aged children who claim to have gone there and back. From magazine articles about my conversations with God to best-selling books where God is depicted as giving special, private communications, we can easily operate as if the Bible were not enough. If we could only have something more than the scriptures, then we would really be close to Jesus and really know his love for us. Listen, this is a damning observation by De Young here because it fits our current American evangelical church culture so strikingly well. We, we so often talk about the scriptures as if they are enough, but then so often in our approaches to evangelism and our counseling and our church growth strategies and our approaches to corporate worship and our pursuit of personal spiritual growth, we turn to everything but the scriptures to seek to gain some better wisdom, some deeper insight, or some supposed personal revelation from God. And when we do this, When we do any of this or all of this, what we are in practice doing is denying the doctrine of the sufficiency of God's word. So how is it that we know that this Bible that we hold in our hands is complete? How do we know that it's final? How do we know that it's sufficient for all things pertaining to life and godliness? Well, we could answer that question simply by reading again 2 Peter 1.3, and that settles the matter. God has given to us all things pertaining to life and godliness. There's also many other approaches that we could take to answering this question, but I love where Kevin DeYoung starts, and he starts here with Hebrews chapter 1, which is why I picked that as our passage this morning, as he helpfully ties the finality and sufficiency of Christ's redemption for us to the finality and sufficiency of God's revelation to us. As we come to Hebrews 1, we see the author begin with a series of contrasts. He first gives us a contrast of eras. He says, long ago, God spoke in this way, but in these last days, notice that decided shift there in verse 2, in these last days, he has chosen to spoke, speak in a different way. He's very clearly giving us a contrast of eras. Today is different than the day is long ago. He gives us, secondly, a contrast of recipients. In those days before, he spoke to our fathers, the patriarchs, the Jewish ancestors. But in these last days, verse 2, he has spoken to us. This is a different age, and God is speaking to a different group of people. Thirdly, he gives us a contrast of agents. In the times past, he says in verse 1, God spoke by the prophets. He spoke by Moses, Isaiah, all the other Old Testament writers. But in these last days, verse 2, the agency of revelation has changed. 
In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus has revealed what God is like, has taught us the will of God, and has shown us fully the path of salvation. And finally, he gives us a contrast of ways. Long ago, God spoke at many times and in many ways. Just think back to the Old Testament, all the different ways that God spoke. He spoke through visions and dreams and voices and a burning bush and pillars of fire and a donkey and writing on the wall. He spoke in a variety of ways at various times. But in these last days, the author of Hebrews says here in Hebrews 1, God has chosen to speak in a single way through the Lord Jesus Christ. The implicit contrast here is that whereas there were many ways formerly in which God spoke to his people, now there is one means of revelation through his Son. And all four of these contrasts and these verses are meant to lead us to the same conclusion. It's the same conclusion spelled out in verses 2 through 4. It's the same conclusion throughout the book of Hebrews. And it is this, that Jesus Christ is the superior and final agent of God's redemption and of God's revelation. We see throughout this first chapter, the writer is going to draw from Psalm 2, Psalm 110, and make several different affirmations to this end. He's going to tell us that the Son is the heir of all things, the Son is the center of all things, the sustainer of all things, the revelation of God, the Son made purification for our sins, the Son sat down, and the Son therefore has become much superior to angels. You see, God has spoken by his Son, and this Son is superior to all persons, all heavenly beings, all institutions, all rituals, all previous means of revelations. That, that is the author's point here in the opening verses of Hebrews, and it's his point throughout the book. And you might be asking the question, well, what does that, what does any of that have to do with the sufficiency of Scripture? Well, here's what it has to do with the sufficiency of Scripture. The Son, Jesus, is superior to all others because in him we have not only the fullness, but the finality of of God's redemption and of God's revelation. We often understand that first part. We often understand that fullness idea that everything long ago was pointing forward to Christ and that in the person and work of Christ, we see it all fulfilled. We often understand that and accept that and readily see that. But it's also important for us to understand the finality idea as well. Not only in Christ do we see the fullness of God's work of redemption and revelation, but we see the finality, the finishedness of God's work and God's revelation. Listen to how Kevin DeYoung puts it when he writes this, God has definitely made himself known. Christ has once for all paid for our sins. He came to earth, lived among us, died on the cross, and cried out in his dying moments, it is finished. We are therefore awaiting no other king to rule over us. We need no other prophet like Muhammad. There can be no further priest to atone for our sins. The work of redemption has been completed. You see, what we must see then is that we cannot separate redemption from revelation. Both were finished and both were fulfilled in the Son. Nothing can be added to the redemptive work of Christ and nothing can be added to the revelation of that redemptive work. If we say that revelation is not complete, we must also admit that somehow the work of redemption remains unfinished. Christ is both God's full and final act of redemption and God's full and final revelation of himself. Even after the life and the ministry and the death and resurrection of Christ, even in the teaching of the apostles in the New Testament, they are simply remembrance of what Christ said or further spirit-wrought explanation of all that he accomplished. You see, what we hold in these 66 books of the Bible, what we hold in these Old and New Testaments are the final, finished, completed revelation of God to us concerning who he is, concerning who we are, concerning how we are to be saved, 
and concerning how we are to live lives pleasing to him. Now, many will hear such affirmations and respond with a question like this. So are you saying that God no longer speaks today? If this is the full and final revelation of God, are you saying that God no longer speaks today, that he's just disconnected from us and not active in our lives whatsoever? Well, we must very clearly understand that, yes, God is still speaking today. Yes, God is still active today. But we must carefully think about how it is that he is speaking today. God is speaking through his son. He is speaking through his son and he is speaking through his word. God is not silent. God has not ceased speaking. God has not ceased being active in the lives of his people. But according to his word, according to the redemptive plan, according to his final and finished revelation to us, he is continuing to speak powerfully and personally and directly but only through his written word that he has given us. The ongoing speech is through his finished, completed, sufficient revelation to us in his word. God is not speaking to us outside of or disconnected from this word. If he were, then his revelation would not be complete. If he were, then he would still be adding to this revelation. Listen to how the great... Presbyterian theologian Herman Bovink puts it. He writes, The Holy Spirit no longer reveals any new doctrines, but takes everything from Christ. In Christ, God's revelation has been completed. And de Young closes with this. To wrap all this up as we tie Hebrews 1 to sufficiency, he writes this, Scripture is enough because the work of Christ is enough. They stand or fall together. The Son's redemption and the Son's revelation must both be sufficient. As, and as such, there is nothing more to be done and nothing more to be known for our salvation and for our Christian walk than what we see and know about Christ through Christ in the Spirit's book. Frame is right, de Jong writes. Scripture is God's testimony to the redemption he has accomplished for us. Once that redemption is finished and the apostolic testimony to it is finished, the Scriptures are complete. And we should expect no more additions to them. I love how the late J.I. Packer put it much more succinctly, but no less truly. There are no words of God spoken to us at all today except the words of Scripture. Or I love how uh, one pastor put it. If you want to hear the word of God audibly, or if you want to hear God speak audibly, read his word out loud. That is where we find him speaking to us today. So, so why does any of this matter? Why does it matter that we affirm the sufficiency of Scripture? Why does it matter that we affirm that what we have in this Bible is God's final, finished revelation to us, and we are not to be looking for any extra special speaking of God outside of Scripture? Why does any of this matter? Well, let me offer you a few reasons why I believe this doctrine is so important for your life and for my life today. Number one, the sufficiency of Scripture allows us to keep tradition in its place. We've talked about this pretty much every week, but I think it is important to to confess again and to remember again that, that we must keep the role of, of church history and the creeds and the confessions in their proper place. When we're affirming sola scriptura, when we're affirming the sufficiency of scripture, it does not mean that there is no place for church history. It does not mean that there is no place for the great creeds and confessions of the church throughout church history, not at all. But what it does mean and what it does remind us of is that we keep tradition in its proper place. And that proper place is always subservient to the sufficient word of God as revealed in the scriptures. It must never trump the sufficient word of God. That leads to our second point, second reason this doctrine is so important for us. The sufficiency of scripture keeps us from adding to or subtracting from God's word. When we come to this word, when we come to the Bible, we have to remember we are coming to a covenantal book, covenantal book. 
a covenantal book between God and his people. And as covenantal books typically conclude with a covenantal inscription curse, we see the same in God's word in Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, and Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. The Israelites are warned repeatedly against adding to the Mosaic law or taking anything away from it. And we see the same sort of warning at the very end of the New Testament. In Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life. You see, as we consider these warnings, we must be careful to heed them and careful to obey them. We must be very careful not to add anything to God's revelation, to add anything to make them safer or better or more in line with our assumptions. We can often do this when we take man-made traditions and man-made wisdom on a variety of ethical issues of Christian living or, or any such thing and make our assumptions and make our conclusions on par with Scripture. Anytime we seek to bind the consciences of other Christians with something that is not explicit in God's word, we are in effect adding to his word. And we are thus violating our commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture. We also must beware lest we seek any personal or private revelations from God on any number of things, of what his will is, of what we should do, of where should we should go, of how we should respond. Anytime we do this, we are playing a very dangerous game. We should always go to God's word and ask him by his spirit to guide us through this living and active word to help us make decisions in accordance to his will. And we should expect him to do such, but we must never follow the lead of someone like Sarah Young in Jesus Calling, who says in her introduction, I know God spoke to me through his word, but I always yearned for more. Anytime we think such, or speak such, or act in that way, we are playing a very dangerous game. Just as importantly as not adding to his word, we must beware lest we subtract from his word either. There can often be a, con a, a temptation when God's word contradicts our own personal feelings or experience, or when God's word contradicts the mood of the culture, or any number of cultural assumptions or presuppositions, but we must never allow our own thoughts or our culture's opinions to dictate what part of God's word we believe and accept and what part of God's word we throw away to the wayside. God's word is perfect, sufficient, and authoritative in all places, at all times, in all cultures. It may not be popular. It may not be palatable to a lost world around us. But if we are to be men and women of God, men and women of this word, we must refuse to bend an inch on adding to or subtracting from this sufficient word. Number three, the sufficiency of scripture ensures the word of God to be relevant to all of our life. Again, Peter promises in 2 Peter 1.3 that God has given us all that we need for life and godliness Paul promises us in 2 Timothy 3, a passage we've already looked at, that Scripture is enough to make us wise for salvation and holy unto the Lord. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 19 that God's word revives our soul, makes wise the simple, rejoices the heart, enlightens our eyes. As we remember and consider the sufficiency of God's word, we are rem reminded of the fact that God's word is relevant, is living, and is active for all of our life. DeYoung puts it like this, if we learn to read the Bible down, that is into our hearts, across, that is across the plot line of scripture, out to the end of the story and up to the glory of God in the face of Christ, we will find that every bit of the Bible is profitable for us. So when we are affirming together the sufficiency of Scripture, what we're, not, we're not affirming that God tells us in the Bible everything we want to know about everything, right? 
There are things that God, in his mysterious providence, things about our lives, things about the world, all sorts of things that we most likely will never know the answers to. Things that belong in that category of, De- of Deuteronomy 29:29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But we are reminded that through the scriptures, though the scriptures may not tell us everything we want to know, they do tell us everything we need to know. Remember the rest of Deuteronomy 29, 29. We often quote that first part, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but remember the rest. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. You see, God has revealed to us everything we need to know to be saved, everything we need to know to live a life of holiness, everything we need to know to live lives pleasing and honoring to him, to make good decisions, to please God, to get to the root of our deepest problems. All of these are found in this sufficient word. We do not need any wisdom of man, and we do not need any further revelation of God to help us figure those things out. And finally, the sufficiency of Scripture invites us to open our Bibles, to hear the voice of God, and to guide us in our lives. As I mentioned in the introduction, it is an enormous problem in the American evangelical church today to affirm in theory, to to affirm in our words, a commitment to God's word and the sufficiency of God's word, but in reality, in practice, to elevate everything but God's word in our lives. As I was thinking on this topic this week, I was trying to consider various areas where we see the sufficiency of Scripture most prominently undermined in the American evangelical church today. And I jotted down five topics. I'm sure there are more, but here's five things that I think we need to be reminded of, that we need to open God's word to hear his voice on and open God's word to find direction on. Number one is in our evangelism. Listen, if you just go to any number of Christian bookstores or attend any Christian conference on evangelism, you are bound to come across dozens and dozens of various opinions and suggestions on how best to evangelize this or that generation, how best to target this or that demographic. And some of those things may be wise enough, but many of them actually undermine the very power of God and the gospel that we are supposedly proclaiming. As we affirm the sufficiency of Scripture as it relates to our evangelism, we don't need to get caught up in the latest trends, the latest fads, the latest silver bullet of how we're going to reach the lost finally in this generation. And equally, we need not get discouraged when fruit doesn't seem to be produced. Rather, as we affirm the sufficiency of Scripture, we should be content to open God's Word to see the commands to live lives of holiness that commend the gospel, to live lives of intentionality in proclaiming the gospel, and then to be content to leave the fruit of God, the fruit to God and to his sovereign work. So in our evangelism, we need to be content to open up God's word and hear from God how we are to evangelize, not every fad and, and, and fleeting thing under the sun. Another area we see this topic of sufficiency come to the forefront is in our counseling. When I say counseling, that could be informal or formal, but what we're talking about here is simply helping people deal with their problems, deal with problems in their lives in a God-honoring way. There's, there's a whole debate that we could open up this morning that I won't, uh, that gets into biblical counseling versus secular counseling or a hybrid approach called integration. But, but I, what, what I want to say this morning and just remind you and affirm to you this morning is that if we believe that God has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness in his word, then that includes all things to help us solve the problems in our lives in a God-honoring way. Now, that doesn't mean that God has not given us common graces through medications and other things, perhaps. There are times for those things, no doubt, at at different times. But it does mean that the first and ultimate place that we go to find help, 
to find definitions to, and to find solutions for our anxiety, our fears, our trials, our traumas, or any other thing is the Word of God, not the DSM. Is the Word of God not some psychologist, some psychiatrist, some man-made wisdom or counseling? We must affirm in our counseling, in our solving the deepest problems of life, that the Word of God is actually enough. And the word of God is powerful. Number three, we see this apply to our church growth. I'm sure you've seen this. I've seen it as well. So many churches and pastors today approach the local church more like a Fortune 500 business than they do a divinely governed institution of God. You know, I've had people ask me pretty much every year what my plans are in the new year for growing the church. And, and, and I appreciate the heart of this question, because who among us in this room, who among us as God's people, doesn't desire for the church to grow, doesn't desire for more people to come to Christ, for more people to be discipled, for more people to join us as we worship our Lord and Savior? Of course we desire that, and we, and we want that. But I also recoil a bit at that question every year, because it presumes that we can actually orchestrate growth in some way. The fact is, you can orchestrate growth, but not the sort of growth that we want to have here at Grace Bible Church. Listen, I've, I've told many people, and I'll tell you this morning, I can almost guarantee you, and this isn't me being cocky, this isn't me trying to be arrogant in any way, but I can almost guarantee you that we could double in size in the next two months if all we were worried about was building a crowd. Listen, it is not hard to build a crowd, but that is not what we're about. My, my answer to that question of what I plan to do in the coming year to try to grow our church, my answer is the same year after year after year. My plan is to make sure that we are faithfully proclaiming the word of God, faithfully pursuing biblical discipleship, and faithfully pursuing biblical evangelism. If we are faithful to those things, and God in his good providence chooses to give us growth, praise the Lord. And if we are faithful to those things, and God in his good providence chooses to keep us the same or even chooses to decrease our numbers, praise the Lord. We must not orchestrate growth by man-made wisdom. Rather, as we consider the nature and the purpose of the local church, we must get our marching orders from the sufficient word of God not from any earthly man-made wisdom. And that leads to the fourth thing, and that is in our corporate worship. As I said a moment ago, it is easy to build a crowd, and I'm primarily referring to what it is that we do in our corporate worship. Listen, I've been a member of a church that gave away a car on Mother's Day, that had raffle tickets for outlandish prizes for everyone that showed up on Easter, and that opened services with songs like Highway to Hell, and Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball. And let me tell you, that church was packed with thousands of people. They built a crowd. But as the old adage goes, what you win them with, you must keep them with. And God is very clear in his word what we are to do when we gather together for worship. We are to preach the word, sing the word, live the word, see the word, pray the word. We are not to come up with gimmicks and showmanship and door prizes to try to build a crowd. It will work for a season, but it will not be honoring to God, and it will not uphold the doctrine of the sufficiency of God's word. We must be committed to the sufficiency of the word as it relates to what we are doing as a local church when we gather for worship. And finally, perhaps the most prominent way we see the sufficiency of Scripture attacked in a practical way is in a pursuit of our own spiritual growth. I cannot tell you the number of people that I have had personal conversations with or far more that I've seen on social media that are constantly looking for something new, constantly looking for something fresh, something exciting to really help them this new year grow closer to Jesus in their relationship with him. Now, this is purely anecdotal. This is not based on any firm facts. But anecdotally, what I've experienced, I would venture to guess 
that at least eight or nine out of 10 of those people that are looking for something new, something fresh, are not regularly giving themselves to communing with God through his word in the scriptures. Instead, they've, they've actually become bored with the scriptures. They've neglected them. They're looking for the quick fix. They're like the person that is constantly looking for the newest diet pill to quickly lose weight rather than giving themselves to the low, slow hard work of actually burning more calories than you take in. So often we approach our spiritual growth like that. We're looking for the quick fix. We're looking for the new fad, the silver bullet. The fact is, though, God has already given us a perfect, infallible, powerful, and authoritative method for growing spiritually and growing, growing closer to Jesus. And that is through his final, perfect, authoritative, sufficient word that he has given to us in his life, in our life, that we, he has promised to work powerfully in our lives through the work of, our, of the Holy Spirit. So, so rather than looking for something new, rather than looking for something fresh, may we give ourselves afresh to this sufficient word and see how he would work mightily in our lives. And that leads us to our final thing. Not only are we affirming this morning that God's word is sufficient as we think about sola scriptura, but finally, God's word is worthy. As we head into New Year's tomorrow, many of us are reflecting on the year past. We're thinking about the new year to come. As you're thinking on that, let me offer you just a few things to consider afresh that God's word is worthy of in your life this morning as we close our time together. Number one, God's word is worthy of your delight. It's worthy of your delight. As, as God's children saved by his grace, called into his family, you and I hold in our hands the very words of our heavenly father the very words of our creator, God. As you think about that mind-blowing reality that you hold in your hands, the very revelation of God concerning himself, concerning yourself, concerning salvation, concerning what it looks like to live lives pleasing to him, we should declare with the psalmist in Psalm 119, my soul keeps your testimonies, I love them exceedingly. Throughout Psalm 119, we see the psalmist repeat his delight over and over and over. He can't help but speak about God's word with the deepest emotional language, referring to the words of Scripture as sweet like honey, the joy of his heart, and positively wonderful. As we consider this sufficient word this morning, as we consider the worthy of the word this morning, be reminded that God's word is worthy of your delight. Secondly, God's word is worthy of your devotion. There are all sorts of things that we want in this life, but there are very few things that we actually need. God's word is one of those things. As we read Psalm 119, we see the psalmist constantly aware of his need for the word of God. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord, he says in verse 31. He is constantly desperate for the encouragement found in God's promises and even in God's rules. And every true Christian here this morning should feel deep in our bones an utter dependence on, an utter devotion to God's self-revelation in the scriptures. As we devote ourselves to his word, we see our entire lives directed by it. We see as we look through Psalm 119, we are to sing the word, speak the word, study the word, store up the word, obey the word, praise God for the word, and pray that God would act according to his word. We, we, we don't see God's word as some optional add-on for the super spiritual Christians or for the pastors. We, we don't see God's word as a crutch to grab onto when times are really tough or when our faith is especially weak. We don't see it simply as a tool to win some spiritual or moral argument against some, someone in our life. We see it for what it is as the perfect, authoritative, inerrant, necessary, and sufficient revelation given to us by our creator God, given to us to delight in, to desire, to depend on, and to direct our lives by. So God's word is worthy of your devotion. And finally, 
God's word is worthy of your discipline. And Paul tells us this in 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Train yourself, or another translation, discipline yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. D.A. Carson says this of prayer, but every time I read prayer in this quote, think about Bible study, think about commitment to God's word, because we could equally apply it to our commitment to God's word. He says, we do not drift into spiritual life. We do not drift into disciplined prayer or disciplined Bible study. We do not grow in prayer unless we plan to pray. That means we must set aside times to do nothing but pray. What we actually do reflects our highest priorities. That means we can proclaim our commitment to prayer until the cows come home. But unless we actually pray, our actions disown our words. As you consider your New Year's goals this morning, make sure your actions do not disown your words. M make your devotion to your delight in and your discipline to God's word as one of your top priorities this new year. Set aside a, a daily time and place. Have a plan. Commit to the memorization of and the meditation on scripture. Let the practice of your life match the profession of your mouth as it relates to God's word. Profess with your mouth, no doubt, that God's word is authoritative, inerrant, sufficient, infallible, and inspired, but also practice in your life with that same devotion and discipline to this word that such a revelation of God demands and deserves. I pray that as we have gone through this study on Sola Scripture, I pray that you have been reminded and reinforced of these glorious truths concerning God's word. I pray that as you have been reminded and reinforced of these truths, that you would guard against elevating any human authority to the same level of Scripture. I pray that you would see God's Word as the basis for everything we do here at Grace Bible Church. I pray that this study has bolstered your own commitment to God's Word, and I pray ultimately, as we have said week in and week out, that you would ultimately see the study of this Word pointing you to the one whom these scriptures are about, that you would behold Christ, that you would see Christ, that you would love Christ, that you would be devoted to Christ, that you would see the salvation that he offers in his word by grace alone, through faith alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. I pray that you would see yourself as a sinner in need of the saving work of Christ. I pray that you would see the beauty of Christ and what he has done, and I pray that you would turn from your sin and trust in Christ this new year. And as you do so, that you would remember these truths, cherish these truths, and constantly turn to this word day in and day out as the authoritative, inspired, inerrant, and sufficient revelation of God that it is. Well, Lord willing, next week we will return to our verse-by-verse -verse study of Paul's letter to the Romans. We'll pick up in verse 1 of chapter 3, so I'd encourage you to start reading chapter 3 this week. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Let's prepare our hearts and minds to come to the table as we remember afresh the beauty of the gospel in taking these elements. <laughs>